Welcome back everyone to another Q&A. This is a continuation of the last one where I asked everyone to submit questions, so here's five more. So someone asked if I could shed some light on the process of pitching for studio productions. Pitching is the bane of my existence. I hate it so much. If you're one of those unicorns that loves pitching, all power to you. I, I absolutely loathe the process because it's very time consuming, it's very energy consuming, and it usually does not yield any positive results. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't like it. So what happens is if a studio gig is up for grabs, um, which is not most of them, but if there's some gig that they don't have a composer for and the filmmakers don't have someone that they want, the executives will send out a brief. They will send it out to all the composer agencies. And then the agents forward the brief to whoever they think are suitable candidates. And then those candidates can choose if they want to pitch for it or not. You don't have to. But if you do want to do it, then um, based on the brief, you can put together a reel of pre-existing music or new music. All up to you. But it's usually just an audio reel of a bunch of tracks in the style that they're asking for and you put that together either on a website or in some other playlist or um, there are services that offer that type of thing where you can make reels for people usually you also would include like a little bio and a resume or you know some credit list you know just stuff so that they can kind of get a sense of who you are and then they will listen to those reels and select their finalists who they think is a good fit based on the reels that they got. And then they will usually schedule a meeting with the filmmakers or whoever is creatively in charge of that project. They will uh, meet with you either in person or via Zoom. And then they will brief you on usually three scenes from that project that are kind of very different in nature. And so they will essentially give you test scenes to score. So usually you and maybe two, three, four other people are selected as finalists. You're all scoring the same scenes. You all get the same briefing. This is usually unpaid and takes several days, which is also one of the reasons why I don't necessarily like it because it's time consuming. It doesn't contribute to your income. And usually I'm already on other productions. So that means I have to pull all nighters to get these pitches done. Um, which already puts me in a bad position, not just for the pitch, but then also for the project that I'm on, that I'm now falling behind on. So it's not, it's not an ideal situation in general to be spending that much time on something that will most likely not happen. <laughs> um, you can see, I just, I really don't like pitching. <laughs> I wish people could just trust me based on my experience and the music that's out there already. But anyway. That's not what this question is about. Some studios have uh, started paying for pitches if you're a finalist and you actually scored a picture. Apple has started and I think Nickelodeon. So maybe the other studios will also start compensating people for their time because, you know, if you pitch for, um, you know, 50 projects per year, that's a lot of unpaid labor that you have to put in to, you know, get a gig. So. Anyway, that's not what this is about. Uh, so you score these scenes, you submit them, fully produced, uh, fully produced demos, however they want them submitted, and then they will review them and they will basically take their pick from those finalists. And then they will contact your agent, they will make a deal, you'll make a schedule, everything, and then you're good to go, pretty much. So that's kind of how that works. It is important to know that most pitches will be a rejection. Even if you get into the final round, most of the time you will get the, oh, we went in a different direction kind of platitude. That's usually what they say. We, we decided to go in a different direction. Um, most of the time you're not gonna get the gig and it's very, very difficult to deal with, I think. It's very draining. Once you've done your fair amount of pitches, it's very uh, frustrating. And half the time, the reason wasn't even your music or your personality or anything. They actually liked you, but there's some kind of political reason or something happened or someone, 
you know, it's so many different reasons that have nothing to do with your music, why you did not get that gig. And so often it's just not in your control. And it's, yeah, it's very frustrating. It is also important to note that most gigs you're getting, you're not getting from pitching. Most of what I have, I never actually pitched for. It's people that found me through my music, people that recommended me to a production. Um, but it's usually stuff that I get outright hired for. So I never actually had to submit a reel. I never had to you know, write a test scene or anything. It's just people who know me from somewhere and just hire me and they just trust me to you know, know how to do my job based on the nine years of experience I have to show. So yeah, um, again, pitching is not actually, I think, how most composers get their work. It's usually through some kind of relationship and then you don't even have to pitch. Next question. Would there ever be a potential of you doing educational reviews of people's mock-ups, picking them apart, giving advice on what they could do better? Do you teach private lessons? Do you give feedback? Do you teach composition? This was multiple people asking this. Um, a lot of people have also privately asked me this. The answer is no, I do not teach. I do not teach outside of the occasional master class or the occasional, um, you know, guest lecture at a college. I do not teach because I just don't have the time. I can barely keep up with this YouTube channel <laughs> next to my composition work. So um, I definitely don't have time to teach private lessons. <laughs> There's also another reason, whenever I've done this in the past, when I still had more time on my hands, a lot of people don't actually welcome feedback. They just wanna, they just want an excuse to send you their music and then they just want you to be impressed and say all the nice things. And if you don't give that to them, you know, they get a little bit salty. So that's been my experience, or there's just been radio silence when I've made a lot of effort to give someone, you know, um, constructive feedback that they can work on. So most people don't actually seem to want honest feedback. But most of the time I also just don't know what to say because I'm a film composer, so I judge music based on how well it works with the film, how well it supports a scene. That's how I see the music that I write. It's not supposed to be standalone music. Some of it works as standalone music, which is great, but some of it doesn't. But that doesn't really matter because film music is not um, an autonomous art. It, it doesn't have to stand alone. It's all about storytelling and context. And so I don't really know how to judge a standalone piece by itself. And then also, what are we reviewing, you know? Are we reviewing the mock-up, the production quality, the mixing, the MIDI programming, the orchestration, the arrangement, the actual composition technique? Or are we reviewing something to picture, the storytelling? Are we looking at um, how well it works with the dialogue and sound effects? Are we looking at um, how it works in the context of the rest of the score? how you developed a theme. I mean, there are so many aspects that are important that I'm just like, I don't even know how to judge a piece without knowing exactly what we're looking for and what the goal was of the piece. So we would have to have some kind of lengthy discussion first about what you were even trying to achieve and then basically see, did you manage to achieve that? And so there's just no time to do that. It would require so much in-depth, personal um, talks that I just can't do that. A lot of people also ask me for um, a lot of personal advice, which I also can't really give. I can't tell you what the next step in your career should be. I can't tell you what the next step in your life should be or if you should relocate or if you should go to college. I mean, those are such personal things. I would need to know every detail of your life. And even then I could probably not really give you advice because it's also a personality thing. And it's, it's just, you know, I can't really help you on a personal level because I'm, I just, I'll just never have enough information to actually give good advice. Everybody's journey is just different anyway. So that doesn't really make sense, you know, like personal coaching and stuff like that. 
that's really for an agent or a manager further down the line who can kind of take what you've already done and you're already on your journey and then they can kind of take that and guide that into the next you know haven so to speak but um at the beginning for a stranger i would not know what to say but so that was a very lengthy answer to just say no i don't give private lessons i don't give feedback on other people's music unless it's close friends um, or colleagues and uh, i don't give personal advice Next question. Are you ever scared of creating? It can be scary to have so much responsibility to create something good for someone out of nothing. How do you deal with that creative pressure? That's a really fun question, actually. Not a lot of people have ever asked me that. And yes, I've talked about this with a bunch of colleagues. And I think, was it Thomas Newman who said, who, who talked about this as well? Um, I think it was. It's a, it was about how every time we start a project, we kind of have this moment of doubt, this um, lingering question whether we can still do our job <laughs> or if we've just forgotten overnight how to do it um, or if we're the right person for this one, you know, or if we're just going to fail because there's always the option to fail. I mean, A-listers get fired, you know, any week. So, you know, even they fail yeah it's it's scary every single time you start a new project you're just kind of sitting there going well i hope i don't get fired <laughs> it's pretty normal and it probably doesn't ever go away the only way to deal it is really to work through it um because once you're you're getting your first theme approved you're getting positive feedback that's kind of when that fear settles and you're just like okay I'm on my way now. And the further you go in the project, the more confident you become because you found the tone now, everybody's happy. And so, you know, you just keep going. Um, but so the, yeah, the only way to get over that is to just sit down and do the work and kind of power through it for the first couple of cues and then you're gonna be fine. It's kind of like, sometimes I think it's kind of like stage fright. You know how sometimes you go on stage and you're absolutely terrified and then you start to play and once you're in bar four you're fine like it's all good and the stage fright is gone it was just the moment before that was terrifying so it's kind of like that i guess next question i'd be interested to hear more about the creative interaction with the director i know you've talked before about the initial screening and taking notes on what they want for each cue but how does the process typically progress from there? I imagine composers aren't plinking out ideas on the piano anymore like Williams for Spielberg. How much do you generally audition as you work and in what form? What kind of back and forth is involved in settling on themes or other choices? The general consensus is that everything has to be fully produced. Every single cue. Filmmakers want to hear score demos that are essentially 90% the final product. They know that there's still like probably a proper score mix involved later and that there might be some live recording, but what they're hearing during the production process, the composing process should be pretty much 80 to 90% of what the final product is going to be. There should be no surprises down the line. And they need to sign off on every second of music before it is recorded or mixed or delivered. So you don't get to do piano sketches anymore or, you know, some rough sketches. That's not a thing. Um, everything needs to be fully produced. And then you send them an audio file of each cue and you send them um, the cue to picture already rough mixed with the dialogue and the sound effects so they can kind of see how it's going to work in the picture. And then they're going to give notes or they will approve it right away. Who knows? And um, yeah, ideally you have themes pre-approved, so um, by the time you're scoring to picture, hopefully there's not going to be substantial revisions, but um, yeah, they will just give you feedback on whatever worked for them, whatever didn't work for them. You go back in, you do revisions, you send those off the same way, audio file and the file with the picture and a premix, and until they approve it. And then you mark that off and, and you move on. Um, and you work your way through every single cue like that. I'll also usually prepare a batch of cues. You know, I just 
I won't just send like one queue usually, I will send like five or ten queues in one go so that they have something to look at and, you know, give feedback on. Sometimes it's also, um, some executives like to get um, whole acts in one go, uh, which would be um, basically the entire part between commercial breaks if it's a TV movie uh, or a TV show. So sometimes they would like you to just deliver the whole thing so that they can see it in context. And then once everything is approved, that's when you go and orchestrate and record the score, basically. There's still a handful of older composers that don't do mock-ups, that just write with pen and paper, but they usually have younger people then doing the mock-ups for them. Only one or two composers get the budget to actually record their demos and then re-record the revisions and stuff. That's not generally a thing, and once they retire, um, that's definitely going away. <laughs> And while this newer approach is a lot more work up front, it does make the recording sessions much more relaxed because there are no surprises. The producers and the director and the executives, they've already heard everything. So sometimes they don't even attend the sessions anymore because they already heard the whole score. So they're just like, it can only get better if we're adding a live orchestra and a proper mix to it. So um, yeah, sometimes they're not even attending the sessions anymore. Uh, whereas in the olden days, that's kind of the first time they would hear the whole thing and that's kind of when, um, you know, you'd have these situations where they might not like something and have you rewrite it on the spot in front of the orchestra or have you rewrite it during a break or overnight and, you know, chaos would ensue. Which is not a situation that happens a lot anymore because everything is pre-approved before the recording already. And the last question for this one, do you sometimes want to write more complicated music than the film producers want to hear? No, I want to write music that serves the movie best, whatever that is. Sometimes that's complicated music, sometimes that's simple music. It doesn't really matter to me. This is kind of something that inexperienced composers do a lot. They forget to take their ego out of their music. It's not about you, it's not about your music, it's about the movie. If you want it to be about the music, go write concert music or go write songs or music that doesn't serve something else. Film music is here to serve, to serve the story and to serve someone else's vision. And so whatever suits the movie best, that's what I want to do. And in general, I think the more music you write, the less precious you are about individual cues anyway. You know, every movie has like 60 cues or more. So if there's one cue where they want something fundamentally different from what I want to do, it's not such a big deal. There's still like 59 other cues where I get to do what I want. So I think the more you write, the less precious you get about each individual piece. I hope this was helpful. Um, don't forget to buy me coffee or beer if by the time of this um, of this video maybe I've enabled the beer button already, I don't know. Um, but uh, go to the link in the description, buy me a coffee, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.